As we continue our month of considering how our Unitarian Universalist theological roots compel us to action, we arrive at another weighty topic, immigration. We're going to start by, by taking it back, way back. I want to trace a particular theological strand throughout our UU and American history, starting practically at the beginning. For real, at the beginning. Early in 1620, a group of religious seekers set sail from Plymouth, England. They landed on the continent that we now call North America later that same year. We're going to explore a lot more about them in a couple of weeks, but today, here's what you need to know. They were called pilgrims, honestly. And the pilgrims were made up of a few different separatist factions that had broken away from the Church of England for similar reasons, such as the use of symbols, church corruption, and a set of theological beliefs called Calvinism. We, Unitarian Universalists trace our heritage back to these pilgrims, among other sources. Some of their beliefs are still with us, which is why most of our worship spaces are devoid of ornate decorations. And we don't have symbols. The chalice is an argument for a different day. <laughs> <laughs> that is technically our symbol. The pilgrims believe that ultimate authority should be placed in the Bible, particularly the teachings of Jesus, along with Paul's instructions to the early church. They wanted to be free of additional doctrine. They wanted to be free of the pomp and circumstance that had cropped up around Catholicism in the Church of England. And Calvinism stood in contrast to the doctrines of the Church of England, so they were persecuted. And they set sail for what they thought of as the New World, in search of religious freedom. So there are five points of Calvinist theology, and I realize at this point you're holding a lot of ideas in your brain, so I made a visual aid. <laughs> there it is. So this acronym, TULIP, is uh, used to help folks remember the five points of Calvinism. Now having grown up in a Calvinist tradition myself, I want to say that they sound worse than they are. <laughs> but they're actually pretty harsh. <laughs> the total depravity, also called original sin, means that humans are completely sinful and cannot be saved except through God's will, meaning that some are appointed to salvation through God's will and some are not. In fact, most are not, which is called predestination. Unconditional election means that God does not choose people for salvation based on their merits, but on God's will alone. Limited atonement, the substitutional atonement of Jesus, is only for the elect. Jesus died for the sins of many, not the sins of all. You cannot opt into salvation. You are either chosen for it or you are not. Which brings us to irresistible grace. You also cannot opt out of salvation. If you are one of God's elect, you cannot refuse. And then B, the preservation of the saints, salvation, once given, can never be lost. <laughs> so we don't exactly believe that, right? <laughs> but people do, and we want to be respectful of other people's beliefs, but this is where we come from. Obviously, there has been a turning point, so we're going to fast forward now 200 years to the Unitarian controversy. Things had developed quite a bit in our New England churches since the landing of the Pilgrims. In 1825, through a series of events that I can explain to you later, William Ellery Channing articulated the theological attributes of Unitarianism at the Baltimore Sermon. This included a rejection of the doctrine of the Trinity on the basis that it was unscriptural and philosophically unfounded. So you can see here that the same desire that the pilgrims had to free themselves of that which was imposed by people rather than God is present. They wanted a faith free from the influence of humans and their tendency towards power and corruption. So did Channing and the other Unitarians, and so they split off again from those Calvinist Puritan churches in the same search for religious freedom. As the New England churches split, court battles raged over who owned the building, who owned the silver, who had to pay the minister, 
a lot happened in a very short period of time. And then in 1886, Unitarian minister and contemporary Channings, James Freeman Clark, wrote a book titled Vexed Questions in Theology. I love that title. It was a landmark work in which he outlined the five points of Unitarian theology. There you go. There's a reason there's five points, right? This is some low-key 19th century trolling that happened here. <laughs> so but there's some data language here, but, but you can imagine how radical this was at the time. It took the five points of Calvinism and completely turned them on their ear. The fatherhood of God just means that we all come from one place. And if Clark's peers were to take seriously the idea of God as the creator of life, then from that naturally flows the brotherhood of man. We are all equal and profoundly connected in one human family. The next is the leadership of Jesus. Notice here that Clark has not stated that Jesus is divine. Unitarians rejected that idea as part of their rejection of the idea of the Trinity. It should be noted that they still called themselves Christians, and they still held the teachings of Jesus in very high esteem, like many of them might like today. And then we come to salvation by character. And we talk a lot about this in UU churches to this day. This is the old theological battle of salvation by works versus salvation by faith. Unitarians, that was the split of Calvinism and Catholicism, the Unitarian Society is not either one of those. It's actually salvation through character. Salvation is achieved through improving one's character than living a virtuous life. And then we have the progress of mankind. Onward and upward forever. I mean, that's the one, right? It, it just it smacks of the philosophical positivism of the time. We were just high on our minds on this until, what, the Vietnam conflict? 9-11, maybe it's still with us some. Um, and this one has probably served us the least because we all love this idea and then there is pain and heartache when we realize that it is simply untrue. The humans are in fact finite and limited. Okay, so there's Calvinism and Unitarianism. Hope you can take that slide down, I'll thank you. So these are very different, yet not totally separate because Unitarianism, in many ways, is a rejoinder to Calvinism. It's important to note that the foundations of our country are rooted in Calvinist thought. Our founding documents and much of the culture at that time are steeped through these ideas. It's a culture in which the entire American enterprise was conceived was rooted in the idea that some people are chosen and most people are not. And we're going to make a space for people who are chosen. The pilgrims believed, and some modern Calvinists still believe, that it is possible to tell who is chosen because they are hardworking, good, and deserving. And those who are not chosen are lazy, wicked, and undeserving. Anything that challenged that system had to be kept out. There were always non-pilgrims present in the American experiment. Starting with the Mayflower, they were called strangers with a capital S. In order for the Puritan worldview to be cohesive, they had to divide people into us and them. And the others, be they strangers or the indigenous people of this land, did not matter in the pilgrim worldview. They were outside of it. Now, of course, the tendency of humans to create in-groups and out-groups predates Calvinism. But when religious doctrine is used to underwrite bias, horrible things happen. And this religious encouragement of some of our worst tendencies has been used to support institutions like Manifest Destiny, the Doctrine of Discovery, slavery, free market capitalism, and our immigration policies, which are all tied together. Our immigration laws have changed and they've adapted over the years to favor or exclude immigrants from certain countries, legally defining who is us and who is them. 
and when our laws have changed, it has been based on a potent brew of economic fear, xenophobia, and racism, all of which is supported and encouraged by this Calvinist theology that some are chosen and most are not. We find ourselves at a particularly poignant time in U.S. immigration policy. In order for us to allow people to be treated the way that our current immigration policies treat them, we have to believe that they are not the same as us. It is psychologically necessary to believe that they are fundamentally different. They have to be otherized, dehumanized, in order to justify the brutality that is done in our name with our tax dollars. The entire immigration enterprise, particularly as it relates to Latinx immigrants, has been supported by the belief that some of us are in and others of us are out. That some of us are deserving and others of us are not. In the early 20th century, through the United Fruit Company and other fronts, the United States destabilized the politics of our southern neighbors because it suited our trade ambitions. In the late 20th century, we created an economic crisis by setting up unfair trade advantages through NAFTA. And then, when refugees started to reach our southern border in higher numbers, we weaponized the Sonoran Desert, forcing people to attempt crossing in more and more dangerous areas. This has increased the number of deaths of would-be immigrants. Even now, with children dying in American cages and their parents languishing in the Kafkaesque ice jails, people are still trying to cross our southern border. Our increasing brutality is not a deterrent. There is only one reason that people would keep trying to cross our border. They feel they have no other choice. To paraphrase Worship Shire, who we heard from earlier, their home has become the mouth of a shark, a shark that we placed there. Some people, including Adina Chauncey, whom I quoted earlier, have concluded that the only reasonable solution is open borders. And some people find that ludicrous. I see merit and problems on both sides of the argument. There has to be another way. Just as our forebears found another way of approaching the question of salvation by faith that works by claiming salvation through character, we must find another way to frame this debate. Our immigration system is based on the idea that some people are worthy and some people are not. All of our thinking about this is based in the in-group, out-group mentality of Calvinism. And if we take a page from James Freeman Clark and our other Unitarian forebears, though, there is only one group, <coughs> humanity. I think it's important to note that James Freeman Clark was writing against the backdrop of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which he strongly opposed in a sermon titled, The Brotherhood of Man. That sermon reinforced the Unitarian belief that we are all children of the same God and we should be treated as equals. If we believe that we share a common origin via through creation or evolution, we must accept that we are kindred. We have to let go of this idea that some of us are deserving and others of us are not. Our value is not determined by where we are born, the color of our skin, or our native language, or any other marker of identity. We are all siblings who share the same right to life. If we are the brotherhood of man, then we cannot continue to believe that the problems of another country are not ours, especially when our country has caused so many of those problems and our economy and our personal finances benefit from those problems. If we are all siblings in life, 
we have to understand the plight of another is our plight. So maybe we're not ready to go all the way to open borders, but surely there is something in between open borders and locking children in cages. How long can we abide the barbaric treatment of our fellow humans that is only possible through the systemic dehumanization of the other? Not one more day. The move away from these policies is long overdue. In a way, this mess is uniquely ours. As Unitarian Universalists, we are the children of both the architects and the dissenters of these ideas. So let us then be ever vigilant to the propensity that we have to separate. The time has come for us to take up James Freeman Clark's work and bring it forward into the discussion. We cannot sit idly by. We come from a long line of rabble rousers and dissenters, and we need to draw on that fire now. There is another voice in this debate, the voice that reminds us that we are all one human family and there is no division between us. We have equal inheritance as creatures of life. As Unitarian Universalists, we affirm and promote the inherent birth and dignity of every person, not every citizen, every person and not just as a thought experiment or a platitude, but as an action. So let us act now. Let us be bold. May it be so. Amen. Blessed be.